All right, so we talked a little bit about the table operations. Um, these are very, very important. Uh, if can't remember if they're in homework one, but they might be, um, but they're definitely in the next series, like in the next lab and next homework. Um, but so you have select, which is uh, you know kind of what it sounds like, right? So it creates a new table with just the specified column. All right. Then you have drop, which means give me one that it doesn't have certain columns. And then you have sort, which is kind of what it sounds like, where you're sorting by a particular column. Uh, you can also reverse the sort by passing a second parameter of descending equals true, for example. By default, it will sort ascending, uh, and you can switch it. Uh, but you also have where, which will go out and pull out certain roles, certain rows that match uh, in whatever condition you provide. All right, so you're going to use these a lot. Um, the, the need to memorize these, I would say, is actually in some ways kind of low because that goes back to that practice thing, right? Where if you're doing it all the time, it should be pretty easy to remember them because you use them all the time. But at first, it's kind of like you have to like look it up every time. All right. So first thing we're going to talk about is numbers. We've talked about these somewhat already. Um, oh, that was what I meant to say in the announcement. Uh, I'm not sure how many people saw the Piazza post, but did you start a lecture uh, Jupyter Notebook? All right, so you start, you can start a Jupyter Notebook before every lecture, all right, and copy over the lecture notebook so that you can follow along. So feel free to do that now if you haven't done it already, because it's a great period for the first time. Uh, but in general, please do it in advance, because right now, if you try to do it, it's going to be very slow because all of you are trying to do it at once. So I will say two things. One, this is not something that's graded, okay? This is just a handy way to kind of take notes during the class where basically I'm gonna type and you're gonna type the same thing. That way you can kind of keep up with it. It gives you a little bit more practice and you can save them and use them for review later. I will not be distributing the notebook that I use in class, okay? So what you have to rely on is your notes, okay? Or you can come to office hours either with one of the course assistants or the TA or myself, and we can help you, you know, anything that you missed, if you want to go back and capture it, you can obviously talk to someone else in the class about any of the content that you might have missed. So I definitely recommend doing it. Technically speaking, it's not great. It's not required. I'm not going to do like a notebook check. All right. Um, just strongly recommend it. All right. Okay, so let's go on to the demo. So you should have a one that's not filled in. Um, so the reason I don't fill it in uh, for myself normally is so that I go at the same speed you do, so you can have a chance of keeping up with me. Oh, shoot. I didn't realize there was a CSV file. Let me just copy over the file so that you'll have it. Um, Okay, so uh, if in that first cell you immediately get an error, it's because this CFD file here is missing from the lecture folder. I just copied it over there, so just go copy it again and now you'll have it, okay? Um, if, what I really should have is like folders for each of the lectures, but I just have them all black, so sometimes I miss them. So hopefully you can catch up, um, but at first, uh, this first part is just about numbers. It's not actually gonna use it anyway. Uh, so it shouldn't be too big a deal. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the number 20. Okay. So does anybody know what we call a number like 20? Okay. We know 
though it's slightly different than other kinds of numbers, sure. an integer. But if you talk about it in terms of not knowing anything about programming, does anybody know what this is called? Somebody remember this from like very early math? A whole number. Okay, so what we call this normally in English is a whole number. Okay, in programming land, we usually call it an integer. Um, but as I will reiterate a thousand times, programmers are lazy. So we actually call it, most of the time, we call it an int. Okay, and I also want to point out this class symbol right here, which is, uh, let's see, what do you all call it? It's most of us all like a hashtag now, I guess, right? You call it, what do you call that character? Pound sign, if you're really old. Uh, hashtag, if you use Twitter, now Instagram, a bunch of other things to adopt it. You know what its original name is? I love this. I even have a t shirt. It's called an octothor. All right. And the reason is, is because it has eight points on it. If you count it, that's the octo. And the guy who invented it was last name was Thor. Uh, so it was called an octothor for this one. Isn't that a better name? Isn't that more fun to say? So it's called an octothor. Um, but I will usually reference it as a hashtag. Um, but so in, if you do that in line, in code like this, it will make a comment, okay? You've seen them already in some of the examples I've given, um, but does anybody have a theory about what a comment does? Yeah, so, so it doesn't do anything. That, that's kind of what it does is it makes sure that anything after the hashtag is uh, ignored, okay? So that, that it won't be, it won't, it won't try to execute it. So you use it for comments, okay? So it might be a comment about what you're trying to do, or in this case, I'm commenting on what type that number is, okay? Um, so actually, I think I forgot to execute this. Okay, and so theoretically, I should just get a 20 back. And when I did, all right. So now we're going to talk about a division, right? And does anybody know what we call this number? And what we're looking for is the like math word, not the programming word first. Uh, it is not a prime, uh, it's not a prime uh, it could be primary. It's actually unknown, right? Because it's an infinite number of decimals, but any other guesses? A real number? Uh, is that what you were going to say? No, no programming yet. All right. Uh, so it's, it's called a real number or a rational number. Uh, it's also, um, what I was really looking for is like a decimal number, uh, just a simple label for it. All right, in programming, we call that a float, okay? And the reason we call it a float is primarily because it floats between six and seven, right? So in other words, it has a decimal component, but the big difference between this number and this number, as far as programming is concerned, is one of them has a period and one of them has it implied, okay? So we all know, right, that this is actually 20.0 and then endless number of zeros after that. Um, so, but in order to save these uh, in, in less space, we have two different types. So this one's a float and that one's an int or an integer. All right. And so here, my mouse wheel. So here's my next question. So this one, Number three here, right, is obviously a float. What about number four? Is that a float or an int? Uh, how about raise your right hand if you think it's a float? Raise your left hand if you think it's an int. All right, now which way is left and right? Uh, all right, so that is a float, okay? Why? And remember, the distinguishing characteristic is not whether there's something on the other side of the decimal that's worthwhile, it's the fact that there is a decimal sign there, like that there is a period there. That's what makes it a float, okay? So generally speaking, when you do any kind of division, for example, you're gonna get a float as a result, okay? Actually pretty much always, um, even if the resulting number could be an int. 
All right. So what if I do three, four raised to the power of five? What about this one? So what did I give you the first time? Right hand integer, left hand float. What do you think? Well, let's see. This is the right hand. Yeah, okay. So you're all reversed to make sense. All right, so this is an integer again, okay? Because it doesn't have a decimal, it doesn't have a period in it. So it's really straightforward, it's very simple. Don't think of it as a number, just look for the period. All right, and then we can get ridiculous about it and make really big numbers, okay? So we'll do uh, one through nine raised to the power of 12, 34. Uh, and we get a very, very large number that is also still an integer, okay? Because it doesn't have a decimal. Um, and the distinction is important because the, the computer cares about the difference. I turned off literally everything that can be making a noise. I don't know what's going on. Um, let me see what the next example is. Um, all right. The next one, I oh boy. Let's see if this will work. So this one is very simply, oops, a float, right? It just doesn't have anything to the left of the decimal. But then we can also do something like, and I'm just gonna do an arbitrary number of zeros here. Hopefully it's enough. All right. And you see that I get still a float, right? But I get this e minus 0.7. What do you all think that means? So it's basically shifting this five that way, 27 spots. Okay. But in order to not have to put 27 zeros here, 26 zeros here, it makes it a little easier to read. So that's what's going on. Whenever you see that e, it's it's basically showing the exponent, all right. Uh, if you ever did any high level mathematics, this is not Euler's number. This is an E for exponent. Okay. Um, I find them often very annoying, just FYI. Um, all right. But so now I'm going to cut and paste this one because it's very long. Um, but what I want to show you is. If I subtract these two numbers, what should I get? Ball point, right? Somebody just said something over here. Do they know what I should get? No. Do you think I should get zero? Or will I get zero? You should not get zero, right? Because there's like all this chunk over here, right? It should like be a result. But in fact, I will get zero. And we know why that might be. So, and that answer? Okay. Yeah. It, it, it rounded, overflowed, there's kind of a bunch of different words for it. I mean, there's a very technical reason for it. But basically, this is part of the reason why we have a distinction between integers and floats, is that if the numbers are sufficiently big, the computer can't handle it, okay? And when I say big, these are actually very small numbers, right? I mean big, like width, okay? It just kind of can't do the actual math because there's too many digits involved, okay? So if you need to do this kind of math, you have to use alternate techniques. Most of the time, obviously, this kind of thing isn't very common. But just kind of keep in mind that the precision of the computer is not always perfect. Okay. You may have experienced this on a calculator um, where you can get a calculator to, to get screwed up as well, where you can basically blow out the precision on it. Um, tend to be calculators because they're designed purely for just doing, you know. Uh, arithmetic operations versus this computer, which can do a lot of different kind of operations. Um, they tend to be have very big uh, areas in which they can play. So, but just keep in mind that sometimes you'll get a result that is really weird. Um, and so just remember that it might be because of precision. All right. 
Let's see. Another example I just wanted to give, um, well, yeah, I'll go back to the slides. Uh, not yet. Okay. So another thing I want to give an example. So I said division tends to result in a float or does almost always result in a float. I can't think of anything else, but I hesitate to ever say always. Um, so another one that results in floats is exponents. So when you raise, you know, 10 to the two, you'll get, um, you'll get it as a float. You won't get it as an integer, even though it is an integer. Okay. So when you do operations on numbers, it tends to default to go in towards a float because it'll generally be more accurate, right? Um, however, we can fix that if what we really want is an integer by using this built-in function called int. Okay, we talked about functions, I think, last time. And so instead of getting a float right here, I will actually get an int. Okay. However, let me see. What do you think is going to happen here? So if I do 20 divided by nine and turn it into an integer, get around it. Actually, really, it's not even rounding it, right? Not in the technical definition. Programmers will often say round, but what they really mean is it's going to lock off the end just to ignore it. It's not going to actually round it. So in other words, if it comes out to be 0. 0.6, it's not going to make it the next number higher. It's just going to chop it off, okay? So, as somebody said back there, you are going to get two. Okay, so that's that's incorrect, right? So keep that in mind as well. Is that make sure what your the operation you're doing is is okay to essentially like lop off the stuff to the decimal. Um, all right. However, I can also go the other way and do float three, for example, which is just going to turn that integer into a float. Um, and then, sorry, I'm just looking at my examples. Um, yeah. So, you know, so basically you can just kind of convert them back and forth. Okay. And it's usually referred to as a conversion. Just keep in mind that a conversion is relying on you, the human who is intelligent to deal with the fact that the computer is stupid. And doesn't know that lopping off those everything after the decimal is usually a bad idea. Okay, so make sure if you're using some, um, a method like int that you are doing it correctly. That you're going to get the result that you want. All right. Where is my? So back to the slides. A little bit of formal definition. So real numbers and writing them. So in mathematics, a real number is a value of a continuous quantity that can represent a distance along the line. Clearly a mathematician wrote that. Uh, it's a number, it's got a decimal. That's what I know. Scientific notation, right? That's what we were talking about. That's what the E is, okay? Is it's using scientific notation so that you can basically just make the, the string of digits, right? Smaller. That's really all it's doing for you. Um, and so you usually see it with an E like this and then a plus or minus. I would say the vast majority of the time you usually see this a minus. It's usually like to the right of the decimal place that you tend to see most of the time using scientific notation. Um, this is true in almost all programming languages, okay? But in Python, this is exactly how they represent them. Um, and then in Python, we talk about integers and floats. And all right, so an int is an integer of any size, and an int never has a decimal point. Uh, floats have an optional fractional part, but will always have a decimal point, right? Um, and it may be scientific notation. You won't see scientific notation in int. Um, and they have a limited size. If that limit is huge, that was the example I gave you where it, it lost part of the number, okay? Um, so basically, if the length of your number is 15 or 16 decimal places, okay, it's likely to be too big. Okay. Um, it, it, this is a weird thing to say because it actually depends a little bit about your computer. Okay, so your individual computer will change the length of how many digits you can actually have. 
most of your computers will do about 15 or 16, but you can buy computers that will do a lot more and you can buy computers that do less. Um, and yeah, and so the final two decimal places can be wrong when we're talking about those really big in count digit numbers, right? Um, which is a, a very weird thing to say because really we're just talking about the length of the number. We're not actually talking about its value. All right, those are just All right, so moving on to strings. Okay, we've talked about strings a little bit. We have a little bit more examples here. Okay. Maybe Yoda. Uh, I use the right keystroke. So that just makes a basic string. Um, what will happen if I do this? Oops. Any ideas? Yeah, why is that? Right, an extra quote mark or apostrophe um, because it isn't. And you will actually, if you ever, if you have any friends who are programmers or have a programming background, they tend to do a lot of dropping of apostrophes because they're so used to dealing with these kinds of problems. So remember how I said, uh, well, not yet. So I get an error just as predicted, but then I can say, baby Yoda, how do I fix it? I use what's called an escape character. Um, I don't know if I typed that correctly, but you get the idea. So this slash here is referred to as an escape character. Okay, and what it means is I want to escape. Okay, so this means that that apostrophe is kind of escaping from being read as an actual apostrophe, and it's just part of the string. Okay, so uh, let me scroll a little bit back up. All right, does anybody notice anything different about this line here and 13, the bottom 13 up there? Or really the 13 combo versus the 15 combo? They went to double quotation marks, right? So it's it's essentially the same, right? Except for that escape character. Why is that? Well, because this is where it matters. One of the places where it matters, it can, help, it can matter elsewhere, but the ones you're generally going to deal with Another really easy way of putting that apostrophe in there is by just making it like this. Sometimes it's hard to type over my shoulder. So now I didn't have to escape that apostrophe, right? Because it doesn't match this character here. So I can just put double quotes around it. And because it doesn't match, it's going to work fine. The reverse is also true, right? Let's say I had a string, but it had a quote in it, like a person, right? And so in there, I wanted to put double quotes around it to indicate that it was a quote from a person. If I put single quotes around the whole thing, it will also ignore double quotes. So the same rules apply. You can also use an escape with the double quotes, just like the single quotes. So basically, all the things I just showed you are also true in the reverse with double quotes. All right, so this is where we start to get into one of the reasons people like Python a lot, because I can do something like, oh, wait, let's use my actual example. Draw plus, nope, nope, very, okay. And I will result in adding the strings together, right? And it, it kind of works, generally speaking, what I think of as logic. Okay, so it's just going to combine those two strings together. I can also do cool things like, let's see what my other examples are. Um, oh, I can also make it slightly more sophisticated by doing straw plus space plus very. And so now I can put a space in there. I can also have that in the quotes, but as you can see, um, but now I can also do cool things like multiply. All right. So what do you think that's going to give me? Uh, 
Yeah, uh, ten times. Uh, I wanted someone to cackle like an evil villain, but that's okay. All right. So again, it kind of feels logical to me, at least, right? Is that okay? You know, I'm, I want it ten times, right? I multiply it by ten. Um. However, if you start getting fancy. It's not going to work. Okay. It is not going to figure out that by five and a half, you meant just put an L at the end, like do five and then do one L. Okay. It will do the straightforward stuff, but it won't do things where it's going to have to like figure something out. Like, what did you mean by half? Right. Especially if you had like, um, you know, five characters in your string, what does half mean? Right. Low is a simple example. But so you're just going to get, in theory, an error. There we go. So you get an error because you can't, it doesn't, it, it's not going to think for itself. Okay. At least at this level of programming. Chat GPT is a different story. All right. Um, so there are some things that I dislike about Python, and I will show you a couple examples. Well, I'll show you one example. There might be more later. Um, so as we established before, it's really easy to make an int, right? From, a, from like a float or whatever, but we can also do it from a string. So we can just say convert it, okay? If I do int and then do 3.3, what do you think I'll get? Actually, let's make it simpler. Let's do 3.0. What do you think I'll get? Any ideas? Any other ideas? Somebody in the back? Three? Okay. Uh, those, those seem like all of the answers that are possible, uh, but the answer that is correct is an error. All right. So this kind of annoys me, right? Because if I type in the number 3.0, it would just lop it off and give me a three dot, right? But because I typed it as a string, it gives me an error. I like programming languages to be 100% consistent. And I feel like that's inconsistent. I understand why it's there, but at the same time, that's the kind of thing that annoys me. All right, so one other thing I'm just gonna show you quickly is that just like with int and float, I can also convert things to a string by passing them to the string method or stir method, okay? So that just made it a string. I can do it basically with anything. Um, I can even do it with a string if I really want to. Seems kind of pointless, but I could. Um, but that gives the idea is that I can kind of convert both ways. Just keep in mind, there are some places where, um, you know, if it, if it doesn't quite make sense to you as like a really obvious operation, like the low times 5.5, or sometimes there's gonna be a little bit of vagrance in how you know how it's gonna respond when you ask it to do something that I feel like is logical, but some programmer in Python land disagrees. And until I wanna go fix it, they're correct and I'm wrong. So, strings, a little bit of formal definition. So, All right, so first of all, I just mentioned character and then weirdly usually pronounced char, okay? Char is the shortened form of character, like int is short for integer, okay? But it is 99.9% .9 of the time pronounced char, not car, okay? Um, a string is a set of characters of any length. For example, a word, a, you know, a word that can be two sentences, here's the second set of String consisting of numbers can be converted to numbers pretty easily, okay? Um, and then any value can be converted to a string as well, okay? And this is actually works pretty much arbitrarily all the time on most, almost everything. So it can be really a handy way to try to figure out why you have a problem with a bug is that if you convert whatever name you have, right, or a variable you have into a string and print it, sometimes it'll tell you 
you know, the thing that you thought was in that variable is not what was there. So that can be handy as a, as a, what's called a debugging technique. All right, so now we'll move on to types. Okay. So I've been kind of alluding to it all the way through, right? Is that we have an integer, which um, that number has a type, okay? And its type is int. I can sometimes convert the type. I can convert an integer into a string or a float, but it then changes type, okay? So conveniently, there's a function that will tell you the type of something called, intuitively enough, type, okay? So if I just call type on that 10, I get an int back. Now, obviously, what would be a lot more useful is instead of 10, if I'm using like a variable, right? Is to find out, oh, this thing is a string and I thought it was a float, right? So that's where it's super handy. Um, but the idea is that you can always find out the type of something. Uh, and sometimes it's really useful to know it, particularly when you're not sure what's in that variable, okay? Because you did some operation and you're not sure what the result was, okay? For example, you did division and it should have been an int, right? But it actually comes out of the float. If you run type against it, it'll tell you which one it came out as, right? Um, and type works on everything, okay? So it will work on type ABC. Oops. So that tells me it's a stir, but keep in mind, and I know I have used this with exam question before, is that if I ask you the type of that ABC thing, if you put in string, I'm going to mark it wrong, okay? Because this is the Python type is called str or stir. Yeah. Uh, if you allow, oh, like pass more than one thing to it? Oh, uh, no, because you can't be in two types. So, so the question is like, can you have like, uh, let's say I had passed in 10, right? And arguably it could also be a string. Any given thing is only one type at any given time, okay? So if it's a variable, for example, you can switch its type by, you can say A equals 10, right? And then you can say A equals tractor, right? And now it has changed type to A hat, but it can only be in one of those types at any given time. Okay. So we can also do it on kind of more complex things. So as I uh, caught at the beginning, um, I can't type. So at the beginning, I loaded that CSV file into a table called skyscrapers. And so now here, I can ask for the type of that thing, okay? And it's a data sciences table table, okay? So a lot of times we can use a shorthand when we're, we're kind of leveraging the thing, but that's its formal full name for that type, all right? Um, and then one other thing that we've seen already, which is type ABS. Okay, so what is it? Does anybody remember what ABS is? About what type of thing is it? The function, right? Or in the case of Python, which can't quite decide whether they're called functions or methods, it's type is built in function or method. Okay, so. That's a type in and of itself. So like I said, you can use type on literally anything that I can possibly think of. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's anything. Um, another thing that we haven't really talked about yet, but you may have used, I'm not sure, um, is we also have this thing, which is true, okay, with a capital T, and false with a capital F. Okay, those are also built-in things. Does anybody know what we call the true and the false? Boolean. A Boolean, okay. I don't know the word origin of that one, um, but it just means it can be true or false, okay? Um, and you can do lots of cool tricks with Booleans, so that's why they're super useful, which we will discuss in later classes. But as you can see here, it also has a type, okay? 
again, lazy, so it's not Boolean, it's just bool. Okay. No idea. All right. Each value has a type. So we've seen these types so far. But, you know, it essentially works on everything. Um, and so, like I said, it starts getting a lot more interesting when you're not quite sure what the type of the thing is or what type of thing it will result in. So, for example, the two plus two result in a float or an int. Okay, well, the type will tell you. Um, and again, the type is based on the value, not how it looks. So, when you do this, right, it's going to give you a type x equal to int. Okay. Because it's whatever's in there, not the thing itself. And that's also why it can change. Okay, so X can be assigned to a table later, and all of a sudden now it's type is table. All right, so conversions. Um, you can generally convert any number into, a, uh, oh, sorry, any string into a number, okay? That makes sense, okay? Um, I know, especially when I was like early in programming, I expected that to work 1.2. Okay, but it doesn't. Okay, it has to be like numeric digits and then it can convert it. Um, anything, pretty much everything can be converted to a string. Um, and then you can often convert numeric types. Just sometimes it's lossy, right? And that's that's the technical term is sometimes we have a conversion that's referred to as lossy. And as you might imagine, lossy just means some, it's some information is lost. Okay. So a great example of this is a picture. Okay. So let's say you take a picture on your phone. There's some massive number of megapixels, right? That is uh, going to give you that picture. Then you post that picture to Instagram. The quality of the picture you post on Instagram is not as good as the one that you took because the conversion for the Instagram photo is what's called lossy. It loses some of its resolution so that it can be small enough to fit basically the path to the web. So otherwise you'd be waiting for an hour. All right. Anybody here into photography? All right, you ever dealt with like raw files? All right. So if you're if you're really into photography and you start using like DL, wait, DSLRs, uh, um, they they actually have a special format that will give you really high resolution images that you really don't want to push anywhere because they're just, they're so big. Because as soon as you try to move it somewhere, it loses information a lot of the time. And so the huge problem, one of the projects I, or one of the companies I worked for uh, did a lot of um, uh, like movie manipulation. So basically when you're doing movie editing, for example, this company I worked for, apparently every lighting effect you see in a movie for the last, call it 20 years, so whether it's a lightning strike in the sky or like a solar flare on a car or whatever, those are all digitally added. Okay, none of them are real. Um, and so as a result, because it's a movie, right? Very high resolution video. Um, and let's say they're shooting in New Zealand, but your video editors are in LA, right? Moving those files around is not easy because it's a huge amount of data you're trying to pass across. It can literally take a day to copy that, you know, day shooting a video to LA, right? Maybe more. Sometimes in many of these cases, it's actually faster to put it on like a hard drive and then mail the hard drive. Kind of crazy. At least I think it's kind of crazy. Um, there's actually a, a service from Amazon that you can buy that's called, um, I think it's called Snowball. Um, where they actually will send a tractor trailer full of hard drives to your location so that you can load all the data onto it. Then they will send the tractor trailer to one of Amazon's data centers and put all the data on their servers for you because it would just take too long to migrate it all off of your servers to their servers. But they, yeah, literally roll up in a, in a tractor trailer. And I think the trailer itself is called a snowball which is kind of funny because the service they offer around is called Glacier. All right, now we're gonna move on to another type, 
And keep in mind, this is a little bit, you know, this whole like lecture is a little bit of a kind of a survey of all these different features. You're going to use all of these, but you will be kind of slowly indoctrinated to them in the various labs and the homeworks and that kind of stuff. You're going to use them over time. I just kind of was giving you a sense of what they are. All right, so next thing up is an array. All right. So arrays are really simple. So arrays are just lists of things, okay? Because it's often easier to carry around a bunch of numbers at once, right? Instead of a single one at a time. So for example, let's say we had a set of heights. And if you have a Python programming background, um, we use this function make array in this class because it forces an array to all be the same type. Later in the semester, we'll start using arrays that have can have different types mixed together. But for most of the stuff we do, it's really it's important that they all be the same type. So let's say I have a list of heights, 67 inches, uh, 60, 71, 63, 65. So characterized by using the function make array, we have parentheses because it's a method. And then we can have any number of parameters and it'll just all get added to the array. And then let me print height because an assignment operation won't print by default. And now you can see I get an array of those heights. Um, and so I can now carry around that one name, that one variable called heights, and it has all of them in it. Okay. So um, and often, often square brackets. Okay. Um, one of the things about programming that you probably don't know, right, is like we know all the words for parentheses, square brackets, angle brackets, squiggly brackets. Okay. Does anybody know what a squiggly bracket is? Yeah, raise your hand if you know what a squiggly bracket is. I'll show you a squiggly bracket because they're easily the best bracket because they're called squiggly brackets. All right. So those are the squiggly brackets. They probably have some real name like Octocorp, but I don't know that one. I just know squiggly bracket. Um, but we can kind of do cool operations on arrays. So let's say, kind of like with the strings, let's say I want to divide all those heights and get feet back, right? So I can do heights divided by 12, and it will go through and divide each of the elements of the array by 12, and then make a new array that has each of those values, right? So 5.5 feet. Now keep in mind that's 5.5 feet. It's not five feet and five inch inches. It's 5.5 feet, uh, almost five six. But you get the idea. So you can do a division operation against the entire thing. You can do uh, heights times two, right? And we can do uh, exponents if we want to, okay, ad infinitum. Um, and just keep in mind with all those operations, what is the value of heights going to be? I'll answer the question in a second. What's in heights right now? Or, you know it. Right, just the original one. I haven't modified it at all. I've just printed the modification. I haven't reassigned it to height. Good question. You probably didn't have to run the first stop. No, the very first stop. The one with the skyscraper. Or it had an error. Um, so yeah, if you ever get something is undefined that normally works, it's 98.9% of the time because you didn't run that first cell or the first cell failed for some reason. For example, in this case, if you were missing the CSV file that I forgot to drop into the lecture folder. Okay. Uh, so you can do some other operations on an array which is, for example, you can find out how big, oops, how big the array is, okay? 
and so oops. so I can call len, which again, same in pretty much every part of my life, short for length. Okay, so that's the number of elements in the array. Okay. Then I can also do things like another method you haven't seen yet, but is handy. It's called sum, and that will give me the sum of all the elements of the array. Um, I can also ask for the average of the array, but I'm going to actually use something out of NumPy, which at the beginning I defined as NP. And if you recall, remember I was saying I bring a bunch of tools to any job plate. The use tools I'm bringing is NumPy, which has an average function. And for the reasons of the people who created Python, don't think is something you need at every job site. So as a result, it's in this extra toolbox that we've allocated. And so we call the function average on heights. And that will give us, as you might guess, the average height. Okay. Um, Oh, so, and then we're not limited to arrays that are numbers. So we can say, nope. Oops, let me print it. All right, and so now I have an array of different tuna types, okay? Um, and then you can largely ignore what the, the part about the G type over there, okay? Um, let's get into, can anybody speak, uh, or more importantly, know how to write in a language that is not based on the English character set? For example, most of the Asian languages. All right, so. If you think about most of the Asian languages, uh, a lot of them have like significantly more characters, right, than they do in English, right? Uh, so actually, if you just know about the languages. As a result, the original, shockingly, designed by Americans model for being able to keep track of all of those didn't have enough room for all the Asian characters, okay? This is also kind of true for some other languages too, which have like accents, okay? Um, and it's the, the more sophisticated number of accents that they have, they also fall into this space. But so if it's a very simple one, it will by default use the one that was traditionally originally built for American English. Um, and so it's a much smaller set of character possibilities. But if you see that switch to G type equals U16, it's a much bigger set. And it can include basically, I think, nearly all of the Asian languages and every other language in the in the world and all of the characters that are not, you know, it, that won't fit in that U8. Part of it is because programs originally, when, when computers were first started, the amount of space they had to store things like characters was very small. So you were always optimizing for everything to be, take up as little room as possible. So that's the excuse that's given also, the fact that most programming was done in English languages uh, was a big part of it. All right, so based on the type, though, you can also run into problems. So, for example, if I try to multiply tunas by two, it won't work because it doesn't make any sense, right? All right, so now we want to talk about what's called indexing. So, sometimes we want a particular spot in the array, right? And so what we do is we say item and then the spot number we want. However, that spot, actually, let me do this real quick. You've probably forgotten. I know I would have. Where was that in the thing, right? So if I count this off, right, this is in the fourth position, right? But I said three. Let me know why that is. Uh, how about over there? Yeah. Because it starts with zero. Okay. So when you're indexing into like an array or really anything else, everything starts at zero. 
So this is the zeroth position. One, two, three. So when I ask for the third position, it will be the, the fourth spot. Okay. For me, this gets particularly confusing because if I do that, I can't just subtract or I can't just get the last position, right? I can't say heights dot item land heights, right? I'll get an error because of that same problem. Because it doesn't fit, it's not there, right? Because the length is the count of the things, right? And the item position is based on zero. And when we count something, we don't, like zero isn't a countable thing. That why is why it can be confusing. Um, if you have any programming background whatsoever, uh, this is referred to as an off by, actually for everybody, there's a, this is what's referred to as an off by one error. There's a really terrible joke that I really like which is that there's three major problems in computer science, um, pass invalidation and off by one error. All right, so that is all of my example for arrays. Did anybody get my joke? It's terrible, isn't it? But at the same time, it's also great. Uh, so to get to that first position, I just want to show you an example. Use zero as your index. All right, so arrays. An array contains a sequence of values. All elements of an array should have the same type. And that is, uh, for the sake of this class, that is not kind of in general true. But for a lot, most of the operations we're doing with arrays, it's important that they be of the same type and make array will enforce that. Arithmetic is applied to each element individually. So uh, adding arrays adds the elements. Uh, if they're the same length, oh, I didn't show an example of that. But I could have done heights and then another one called height two or something. And if they had the same number of elements and I added them together, it would give me a result that is the addition of each, each item, right? If they're misaligned and have different number of items, it will throw it out, okay? Um, and then when we talk about that's really be a capital table. So when we say those tables, so like when I pull up the skyscrapers, uh, a column of any given table is an array. Okay. So going, yeah, so going down, that should be an array. They should be all the same type. And that's why it's important that they be the same. So. All right. Ranges. Actually, let's do the demo first. We are starting to run out of time. Let me just see how much. Yeah, this is the last thing. All right, so ranges. So um, so I can do this, and I'm going to cut and paste it because I want to discourage the use of it. Um, I can do make array 0 to 6 like that. Too hard, too much typing. So instead, I'm going to use NP and I want to point out because I just use this most of the time that is NP dot a range, not NP arrange, right? So a range, if you read it that way, you'll see what it does, right? Which is that it gives you back an array from the default zero start to give you six elements. So that doesn't mean it will include a six in it. It's just going to give you six elements back, starting at the starting position, which by default is zero. Okay, this is super handy and will be uh, used a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, you can also change the starting position by Oops. Okay. By saying start at five, okay, and then go up to 11. However, 
because it's just like what I think has been kind of consistent. The the leftmost number is always included, and the rightmost number is always not included. Okay, so inclusive versus exclusive, those are important things to remember because otherwise you'll have lots of headaches. But so the five will always be included, and the eleven will always not be. Okay, because I can do something slightly more sophisticated. Or yeah, like even more sophisticated, and I can do which is count by two. Okay. So it will include the five, but then it's going to skip the six and then do a seven because that's the second one, right? So one, two, then one, two, right? But then it doesn't get the eleven because it doesn't include the eleven. That makes sense. Yes. Makes sense. Awake. Snapping. All right. And yeah, that's cool. All right. So range is an array, and a range is an array of consecutive numbers. Empty a range ends, and then in basically the end position you want, start and end, um, and then start and step um, and step is kind of programmer language for like how much to count by okay it's called a step we'll often refer to it like a step function you'll see that actually in business as well um we'll, and basically it's like how big of a leap are we making by default so if you think about default right this thing is actually being called whether you put them in there or not a zero, like if you don't put it in there, it's putting in a zero, whatever number you gave it, and one. Okay, so those are the defaults, but you can change the defaults by replacing the number. Um, yeah, always include the start, but exclude the end. This is another very common scenario about uh, off by one. And then Oh, we have a couple minutes. All right. So uh, we're not going to really get into too much, but as you saw, you've seen me do a few times now to get a table, right? So to load that uh, common separated values file, like I showed you in the command line, um, into a table. So something I can kind of operate on, I use read table. So if you have a method that is two words in Python, you typically put an underscore between them. Because as I told you before, you can't just put a space. It's got to have some sort of connecting character. And Python uses an underscore uh, to indicate the difference. Other languages use other techniques. Um, and then you give it the file name of whatever that common separated values file is called. In this case, for example, we were just using skyscrapers.csv. Um, and it will read that table from a spreadsheet or common separated values. But you can also just create an empty table using just table with friends. And notice that capitalization, okay? So the capital T for table is important. It will not work if it's lowercase table. So you use a friend or two friends, and that just means give me an empty table. And then you can, using commands we haven't really gotten to yet, that, but you can add columns and rows and stuff to it directly or by hand, right? And then you can use those other methods that we talked about, select, where, sort, et cetera. Um, and I think we'll talk about WB Dubois uh, next time. Um, but this is an early example of data science um, by a really interesting group. Um, but we'll say that for Thursday. Any questions? Yeah. Any other questions?